Back in November, F1 got together to lay out a first draft of proposed rules for the next generation of engines due to come into play in 2021. The idea was to put these proposals before the FIA, the teams, the fans, and possibly, most importantly, a bunch of car manufacturers who may be interested in joining the competition should the engine formula be to their liking. As you probably know by now if you've been watching my videos, the current F1 engine parameters consist of a 1 litre V6 single turbo hybrid with a MGUH capturing heat energy and an MGUK capturing kinetic energy. There is a prescribed fuel flow limit, a limit on how much energy can be absorbed by the MGUK, and a limit on how much power the battery can deliver to the wheels. Naturally, as technology moves on, we expect the rules to be revised to try and keep F1 engines powerful, efficient, affordable, and relevant. As much as some people would like to go back to V12 petrol guzzling monsters, that's not going to happen because, frankly, those are just bad engines in today's world and don't make sense anymore. It's a little bit hipster to me, like using an old rotary foam because you like the way it clicks and whirs. But each to their own, I guess. So here are the new proposals. This is the first draft that F1 have put before us. We need to understand what F1 is trying to achieve with these ideas, and it's not just bringing F1 back to the glory days of the 70s, 80s, 90s, noughties, whenever you grew up with F1. It's mostly about trying to keep F1 moving forward, but without tripping over its own shoelaces. They want to keep costs down so all teams, manufacturer-based or privateer, can afford their engines for the season. Keep engines relevant to the real world. We might think F1 isn't the real world, so we should be able to do whatever we want. But most engine manufacturers just aren't interested in old school engines. F1 wants to be attractive to Audi, Porsche, Ford, Toyota, etc. Also, we're trying to make engines as exciting as they can be. Fans seem to want them loud and angry, so how can we keep that going a little bit longer? We might also want to be able to use the engine parameters to affect the on-track racing. So let's break these down then. We're keeping the 1.5 litre V6 turbo hybrid. Uh, this is the same base power unit quality as we have now. Everyone seems fairly happy that this size of engine with the turbo and the hybrid systems can produce the right amounts of power at the right efficiency. And also it will cost a lot of money to scrap everything and change this fundamental base of the power unit. Allowing, no, encouraging the cars to rev higher. Now this is an aesthetic touch as promoters have been worried about the quieter growl of the V6 engines compared to the loud screams of the previous V8 and V10 engines. The maximum fuel flow allowance will be increased to allow for these extra revs, pushing the high end of the engine speed from around 12,000 RPM to 15,000 RPM. Still short of the 20,000 RPM being pulled back in 2004, but it's something. Personally I'm, I'm not all that concerned about the engine noise. Partly because the main audience, the, the TV audience, gets used to it very quickly. Partly because, especially when you're at the track, the screams of the engine actually make it very tricky to hear anything else. And partly because the sound of the combustion engine will disappear altogether one day, so we may as well start sliding into it gently. Now this rule is basically far more strict about how and where you can develop your power unit. And this is a bit of a no-brainer. As with all components of the car, this is a move to wildly restrict, unconstrained design and development of every part of the car. By boxing engine parts into certain parameters, teams won't be able to spend crazy amounts of time and money on wild solutions across all parts of the engine. In theory, it will also prevent teams from finding solutions that open up exotic areas of development and force a bizarre and expensive arms race. This is the engine equivalent of the bodywork rules that came in for 2009 that put a stop to the increasingly eccentric development of winglets, aerofoils and flick-ups that were appearing all over cars throughout the 2000s. Note that this rural development actually has no specific ideas, it just states the intention to close off some areas of development once they figure out what those might be. This one's about a more powerful MGUK with a manual energy deployment button and the option to save up charged energy over many laps. So the MGUK unit will be much more powerful, providing an even bigger boost of electrical energy deployed into the power of the car. This is inevitable, and every new change in engine formula will give even more power to the electrical part of the engine as technology rises to meet that demand. Again, no specifics on how much power the MGUK will deploy. They'll work that out in the time between now and when they enforce the rules. The current MGUK is 10 times more powerful than the Kurs unit that came before it, but I don't expect that big a leap this time, obviously. More interestingly, the proposal suggests going back to a Kurs style manual deployment so the first time the curse was introduced in 2009 to 2013, it was activated by the driver as and when they needed it via a kind of boost button. 
When the hybrid engines came into use, the deployment of electrical power was automated by the software, much like in a hybrid road car. The computer inside the car decided when it was best to use which combination of electric and combustion power. When button-activated curves was last used, only a certain very, very limited amount of stored energy could be used per lap. These new rules would allow drivers to store energy over many laps to spring an ultra-boost surprise, if needed. Unlike DRS, which is sometimes viewed as a sort of cheaty push-to-pass system, this stored boost is available to both the chasing and defending car, so deciding how and when to store and deploy will be part of the new tactics of racing. It will still allow a chasing car to have a power advantage over the car in front, but only if played correctly. Expect some feints and dummies being played here. They're also proposing removing the MDU-H. Now this is kind of a shame for engine futurists like me. It was proposed in the name of simplicity and costs. Now don't forget part of the thinking behind these rules was to remove barriers to entry for new engine manufacturers. So they worked to make engines simpler than they currently are. But also the MGUH was removed to try and make the cars a bit louder as they actually dampen the engine noise. Unfortunately, this will also make the cars less efficient. The MGUH absorbs heat energy from the turbo to charge the battery, energy which should then be redeployed into the car's driving power. Removing this element will remove a major source of power for the car. And another thing to note, remember the MGUH is also a motor and it's often used to keep the turbocharger energized to prevent turbo lag on acceleration. With it removed, the MGUK may often be used to fill this gap, which means the drivers may be able to use it less for actual curs use. We'll have to see if this is the case and if these rules stand. Speculation isn't always accurate. Some people thought that the new for 2014 hybrids would use electric only power through the slow corners, but that didn't come to pass. Sticking with the single turbo, but with constraints, and a standard energy store and control electronics, uh, which again is a bit of a no-brainer. Um, constraining what the turbo can be and how you can develop it keeps things simple and cheap. And it also proposes giving everyone a standard component, third-party battery and control electronics, as there's very little point spending resources trying to out-develop each other in these areas. Plug and play engine designs. Now this is long overdue in my opinion. Currently, if a team wants to swap engines or gearbox suppliers, they have a massive headache on their hands because parts of the engine that connect it to the rest of the car's drivetrain are different for every manufacturer. McLaren will have been working for a long time now with Renault, for example, to design a lot of their powertrain to get the Renault unit to fit. This rule essentially forces standard connections between elements of the power unit, so teams can swap engines easily between seasons without having to massively redesign parts of their car to accommodate these new engines and parts. It also means customer teams can pick and choose engine and transmission suppliers as everything will still fit. Think of this like laptops and devices having standardised USB ports so you can easily change different devices and they'll still plug into each other easily and you don't have to change your laptop or buy lots of awkward and expensive converters to make everything work. Just plug and play, as it says. And finally, the intention to investigate tighter fuel regs and limits on the number of fuels used. Um, little details given here, but I expect, similarly to a lot of rules proposed, the idea here is to stop overdevelopment at high costs and using exotic materials and chemistry and fuels. There is a balance here, of course, in trying to find fuels that are maximally efficient and perhaps cleaner, but doesn't require continued overdevelopment. Hence why the note here is just to investigate it. So these are the list of proposals as they stand. You might support or reject a lot of these ideas depending on what your philosophy is on F1 engineering and competition. One thing I noticed in the comments to my 2018 power units roundup video was that people tended to hate the engine conservation element that crept into F1 with the despair that certain drivers will be forced to nurse their engines instead of going full welly as they'll only have a certain number of units for the year. This is certainly something to be concerned about when making the rules, but bear in mind that the rules are at least in, attempted to be designed within the parameters of expected engineering skill of the time. This means that the FIA will unlikely rubber stamp a rule set that says you must use three engines a year if it doesn't think engineers can figure out a way to make an engine both last for seven races and be used to near full capacity. I believe it's the intention to have a fast, full throttle competition while not blowing through 50 engines a year, and we are at a stage in power unit technology where this is increasingly possible. I'm not overly concerned about engine conservation rules, even if we have a few hiccups along the way. For example, I do think we're not quite at the level the rules demand this year, but I'm optimistic. 
We also need to bear in mind at all times that we are in the middle of a long era where petrol engines are going to be phased out. At each stage of the engine rules, this will be reflected and there will be attempts to find ways to introduce lighter reliance on the combustion part of the energy and heavier reliance on electrical energy. I'm excited for this transition period. F1 has always been about change, development and progress and seeing how engineers will meet this challenge will be something to behold. I am very interested in hearing your thoughts on these engine proposals. Um, I know rule sets and engines and technology are <laughs> quite controversial. So yeah, feel free to leave your opinion in the comments. Um, keep it friendly, <laughs> please. Thank you very much for watching. And again, thank you very much to my Patreons for support. Are, we, are you patrons or are you Patreons? I've been calling you patrons. Patrons of Patreon. Anyway. Thank you very much for supporting me. Oh, and thanks to Banjo Guy Ollie, who lets me use his music, um, which you can hear now. You should go check him out. He's got a YouTube channel. <laughs>